Our first presentation this afternoon is Finding Francis, One Family's Journey from Slavery to Freedom by Elizabeth J. West. Dr. West is Professor of English and the John B. and Elena Diaz Verson Amos Distinguished Chair in English Letters at Georgia State University. She serves as Director of Academics for Georgia State University Center on African Studies on Africa and its Diaspora, CSAD. Member of the Advisory Board of the Obama Institute for Transnational American Studies, Johannes Gutenberg University, and member of the University of Mississippi Medical Center's Asylum Hill Research Consortium. Her work focuses on interdisciplinary approaches to studies of early to contemporary African-American and African diaspora literatures of the Americas with particular emphasis on connections of spirituality and gender. Winner of the 2023 College Language Association Book Award, her recent book, Finding Francis, One Family's Journey from Slavery to Freedom, which is published by uh, University of South Carolina Press in 2022, melds biography and historiography in its exploration of slaving and forced migration on Black family and kinship formations in the U.S. South. Dr. West? afternoon. I, I know I'm here at a dangerous time because every everyone has eaten and I know what happens after we eat. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, actually start in a different way than I had first anticipated. I'm actually uh, I want to start with a, a two minute video uh, uh, that um, uh, Captures some of our work out of the Georgia State University uh, Project Mapping Lab, uh, where I uh, where I work with a group of student researchers each semester who uh, have for several semesters actually um, helped me on this project, the project of uh, the book that was published in December, but also uh, the work that continues. Um, uh, before I go on, though, I just want to make sure uh, I mind my manners and uh, thank uh, Georgia Archives for uh, the invitation to be here today. Uh, that was very generous, uh, and along with uh, their uh, assistance along the way in in this in this work, uh, they they've just been a really great partner in this. There was uh, one semester where uh, they. Uh, 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 they accepted my request to bring students uh, here, and the students just had an amazing uh, experience behind the scenes, really understanding uh, how interdisciplinary archival work is. So I really appreciate um, uh, their continued support in my research uh, and also uh, the Georgia Genealogical Society. So I want to start uh, with this uh, quick two minute video uh, that gives you this overview of what this this research project um, uh, entails. Uh, there again, there's the the, the book uh, that's one end product, but just to give you a sense of what's been involved and and what we continue to do in this research. So let me see. Uh-oh, it's volume. Oops. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm attempting. Yeah. Yeah, I'll pause it and go back even. Here it is, this little bitty thing there, yeah. This one? Yes, this one. It looks like it, yeah, yeah. 
I'm going to I'm going to take it back just so you can hear it from the beginning. It's, it's a very short clip. OK. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let's see. Is that the? Yeah, I just need to get to the PowerPoint. Okay. Let's see, slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Scared me for a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I uh, I thought I was gonna need uh my my phone with my slides too, so I don't get lost. But actually, I might not need that. So <laughs> I might I might be okay. <laughs> Let's see. Is that better? Okay. I'll I'll try to stay in the mic. Um, Finding Francis is a biohistoriography that narrates the journey of enslaved matriarch Francis Sistrunk and her family from antebellum Georgia to post-World War I Mississippi. The story of Francis and her children reveals how the economies of slaving and Jim Crow dictated forced movements and migrations of African Americans across the U.S. South. The story is told through the context of geography as much as biography and speaks to readers both in and outside academia. Part of my excitement as I reached the finish line for the book's publication was my hope that it will become part of an emerging body of work that reveals the need to bring to light and to explore ways of advancing research and curation that help us to unveil, to tell, and to preserve these previously untold stories. Finding Francis tells both a story and the journey of the story, and it narrates at intersections of the personal and the scholarly. And it is at this point that I feel the need to disclose um, that the matter uh, of the personal uh, is tied to my own familial connection to the matriarch and family of focus in this research. Through my mother's paternal lineage, I am sixth generation in the line of descent from Francis Sistrunk. 
My grandfather's father, Noah Sistrunk, was among Francis Sistrunk's first freeborn grandchildren, born in post-reconstruction Noxubee County, Mississippi. When I started on this research several years ago, I had limited, limited knowledge of Noah and none of Francis, and I did not imagine that uncovering the story of my ancestors would lead me to a deeper and richer understanding of the history of Mississippi, the state of my birth, nor that I would emerge feeling more firmly grounded in the sense of my place and identity as Southern and Black. When I dove into the research in earnest, I described the process and the anticipated product as what I, I called biohistoriography. And the, 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 the sketch that, that you see before me, not really a sketch, but a montage, uh, helps to get a sense of, of what that means or how I see it uh, you know, in, in, in my own head. Uh, and I have to thank actually a student researcher uh, I had a couple of years ago who did a presentation on some of the work we were doing, and she made a poster of that. And this this was the framework of her uh, of her poster. And I was so struck by it. I use it all the time because a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and it really gives a sense of what, you know, what biohistoriography means. Uh, it entails uh, a range of parts uh, mm -hmm. to make up the whole, the whole story. And so, as you know, as you can see on just this sketch, you know, you're talking, uh, you, know, the, you know, the elements of biography, biology, history, genealogy, narration, uh, all these com things come together. And you have to more consciously think uh, about the, the methodology that you are employing to do this research and to tell the story. Uh, so Finding Francis then is this product of, uh, uh, you know, connections of digital humanities, uh, multimodal resources and archives and interdisciplinary knowledge. Um, examples in the research include the use of DNA to tell the story, uh, and you can kind of see on the montage to the left there uh, is uh, an early, um, um, I think that this one was from Ancestry.com, uh, Oprah, some of you who And some of you who have used Ancestry.com, you've seen that, you know, probably tons of times and they update it quite often. And so that's a, that's an early um, um, uh, timeline uh, because Ancestry keeps updating those as their database uh, increases. Uh, so things like um, you know, things like the, um, you know, DN, you know, DNA reports that, the, um, you know, that I accumulated from family members and compared online. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the, um, you know, the conventional things um, such as, uh, you know, community histories, um, conventional archives and census reports, wills, court records, tax documents, uh, many of the things that we've talked about earlier today. Uh, it was a culmination of all of these kinds of resources that, you know, were brought together to, to tell the story. So the, the starting point of the story, though, uh, for me was, three main things, and that is, that was uh, oral stories that had been passed down uh, to me from, uh, you know, from my relatives, my, old, you know, older re relatives, uh, parents, aunts, etc. cetera. Um, photos, uh, they were a few photos, so not, not a lot, but a few fo photos um, 
that dated back to turn of the century, 1900s, late 1800s. Uh, and then um, this sketch, which you, 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 you know, you can't uh, make out the names very clearly, probably, but it's just, to, you know, to demonstrate this uh, or to let you see this one sheet of paper that I started with. And this was um, uh, a sketch that was drawn up by my, uh, my aunt, um, Dr. Annie Sistrong, uh, who was the person in the family most in interested in um, and, and recording all of these stories because you know, she was wise enough to know that so much had been lost uh, over generations through things like fires and people dying, and that if somebody didn't write this information down, it was it was going to be lost and soon. So she just started this this sketch, and her sketch uh, goes back to uh, this couple, uh, Susan and uh, uh, Shedrick Sistrunk is how she writes it. Uh, and that's as far back as she uh, could go. And this is on their um, uh, uh, paternal side. So this was my starting point. Um, and uh, uh, again, working with uh, with my students uh, who uh, this was and this was the the same student actually who loved to take what we were doing and, and try to reimagine it and sketch it out differently. So once we got a little more uh, into the into the data, she just wanted to sketch out where we are and what we know. And, and so this was her sketch at that point. And um, so at that point, uh, that the was circled on top there. That that represents the earliest date that Annie Sistrunk had on her sketch, and that was Susan uh, and Shedrick, and um, and 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 we have their estimated um, dates of birth. Um, sh um, uh, Shedrick's is eighteen forty eight, and but by now you know, we had we had started to um, get into the archives. And so at this point, we could, um, you know, we could make this connection to an enslaver named Jacob Sistrunk. Uh, and we had um, by this time also, uh, and I'll talk about it more, discovered uh, that uh, Shedrick uh, Sistrunk was likely the son of a of an enslaved man, uh, Shadrick uh, Dowdell. Early in the process uh, of combing through the census records and family trees, I began to see how the development of Francis's story hinged on exploring the deep South states of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi in particular. Although the oral and archival records point to pre-Georgia places of origins for early enslaved um, and related cistrons, to date, the most confirmed evidence is in accounts and records from these three states. So finding Francis centers on Frances and her family's 19th and 20th century presence in and connection to uh, this three-state region. And so real quickly, just to, um, uh, uh, you know, to show uh, the, those two areas that are most important in Georgia, uh, on that bordering South Carolina, um, uh, area are the count the the counties of Lincoln, Wilkes, Green, and Elbert. And then uh, in the later periods, 1840s uh, through mid 50s, uh, those uh, western border counties, uh, in, and it includes then the Alabama counties of Chambers and Lee. Uh, this is where uh, um, the enslaver James Dowdell uh, moved from Harris County and where um, uh, Shadrick Dowdell 
uh, eventually ends up, we we uh, find him and his son uh, in Dowdell's will later. While Annie Sistrunk's genealogical chart did not point explicitly to locations other than Mississippi, the 1870 census, which was uh, enumerated in Mississippi, the one I'm pointing to here, uh, exemplif exemplifies post-emancipation records uh, that showed, uh, pointed to the family's pre-Mississippi origins. So 1870, uh, of course, is the first year that African-Americans, the first census that African-Americans are enumerated by name. Uh, and so it's in 1870 uh, that I could look for those, those, those names, Shadrick and Susan, uh, but uh, this was early in the game and I had no idea that I would um, uh, be uh, lucky enough to then see Shadrick's mother's name, Francis, and that's really what set me off on this journey. And you went looking for Shadrick. That found the mother. Right, but see, I, I found his mother on the census. Yeah, yeah. And and so on the on the outline of the sketch that my aunt drew. Uh, she only went back as far as Shedrick. Um, yeah, so it was it was a census. It was that census that that helped me uh, in the discovery of this woman named Frances. Even though uh, Jacob Sistrunk was enumerated as enslaver on the 1860 uh, Mississippi slave schedule. Um, we didn't, my, my research team and I, we didn't find this record initially uh, when we uh, just, when we found the 1870 and 1880 records. So I found no census evidence of the enslaver Jacob or Francis and children in Mississippi prior to 1860 at this early stage. Um, and, but that 1870 census told me uh, that they were from Georgia, because not only did it give me Francis's name, it also uh, uh, told me where they were before they ended up in Mississippi. So I then turned my attention to Georgia uh, and also to South Carolina, because there is significant published information on the white uh, and particularly enslaving Sistrunks and their ancestry, which dated back to Heinrich Sustrunk, who was the 17th century German immigrant ancestor. So tracking enslavers in Georgia and reviewing census reports and slave schedules, we arrived at two potential, two likely uh, Sustrunk uh, uh, enslavers who were, uh, who likely held uh, Francis. Um, one, was uh, a Samuel H.J. Uh, Sistrunk who was in Houston County. Uh, and um, by process of elimination, uh, we, we determined that it was Jacob Sistrunk Jr. who was the probable uh, enslaver of Frances and her children. And um, the 1850 um, uh, federal um, let me see, this one is the, um, the slave schedule. Uh, I compared the Harris County one with Jacob and then his cousin Samuel H.J. Uh, in Houston. And so by using the ages and, you know, other uh, information, uh, we, were, we were pretty confident that Jacob was, was Francis's enslaver. <clears throat> And so with that, I went, you know, I went back and went back to the 1840 census. And on that census, if you see that little star there, um, that's, um, that's Francis as a teenager in the household of uh, Jacob Sistrunk Jr. Uh, at that time, his father is alive. And so uh, Jacob's father is enumerated um, uh, just above him. 
And his, while his father has, uh, I think, eight or nine enslaved people, Jacob only has the one, uh, Francis, uh, as a teenager. Well, a few family trees uh, on Ancestry.com show Jacob Jr. as the biological father of Francis's children. DNA tests from descendants of Shadrick Sistrunk suggest otherwise. So reviewing DNA records, family trees, and geographical locations of enslaved and enslavers that intersected with Francis it became apparent uh, that Harris County was a location of significance and the Harris County account of Fran Frances and her children was intertwined with these three enslaving families. Uh, and um, what I have here are just some snapshots of uh, family, um, from family trees on ancestry um, that I, I tracked um, uh, through relational. So these were uh, these were results of, um, of of my own actually uh, results that uh, connected uh, uh, relationally through DNA and those connections. Uh, through my own line did not connect to uh, Jacob Jr., Jacob Sistrong Jr. And, uh, and again, at that point, um, what I was finding on Ancestry.com, and which taught me very early uh, that you, you, you have to research everything you find on Ancestry.com as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, because, you know, it, 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 it's a natural presumption, I guess, because um, I, in, in fact, I even talked to one of the descendants of uh, Francis's children, and she's a descendant uh, from Shadrick's um, uh, brother, John, uh, who's Francis's oldest son. And, and we know fairly certain that John was biracial. And so her assumption then is that, you know, Jacob was the enslaver, so Jacob must have been uh, uh, the biological father uh, uh, of John. And so as a result, people who came behind her then just assumed that, well, all Francis's children uh, must have been fathered by, uh, by Jacob. Because from her childhood in 1840, um, uh, through the Civil War, Francis was always in the hands of Jacob Sistrunk Jr. So it's kind of a natural presumption. Uh, and it was one of those moments, though, that I, I was just thrilled to see the importance of DNA, though, uh, and especially in the absence of pictures, uh, you know, because I, I have no pictures of, of Shadrick and, and the other uh, five children of Francis, so it's it's there's no way I can just do a quick guess by looking. Uh, so the DNA, the DNA cleared up um, uh, at least one um, certainty for one of Francis's ch children, and that is um, Shadrick, because what I was able to test uh, is the lineage uh, to Francis through Shadrick. So I can't make that same statement for the other five children. And in fact, I'm pretty certain that at least three of the children uh, were fathered by uh, a Watley male. Connections between Francis and Jacob Sistrunk Jr., James Dowdell, and Seaborn Watley uh, were confirmed through numerous records uh, that were primarily tied to Harris County. However, records from other key counties in Georgia and Alabama revealed the circumstances that set the stage for Francis's emergence into early adulthood and motherhood. The following slides illustrate the range of sources 
and records that were combined, that were combed through over a lengthy period, sometimes with multiple looks before realizing what was being divulged. And I, you know, I want to emphasize that that again because um, uh, Watley turned out to be the Watley family, uh, the most central uh, family in this story. Uh, and my, you know, my team and I early on uh, looked at the Watley family, considered them, and decided that there was no connection. <laughs> And so it was about a year later after we hit one of those walls uh, that we went back to the drawing board and realized that, you know, every time we saw Francis, there seemed to be a Watley around. Uh, so we, you know, at that point, we began to rethink uh, the possibility of uh, connections between the Watley family and Francis. Uh, so this is just a uh, sample of the many deeds that 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 um, uh, that we compiled, um, and this one is the deed that shows uh, Seaborn Watley's lot 141 uh, in Harris County, and that that turned out just to be an amazing uh, find, as you saw from the that short video. Uh, that my former grad student and now colleague Josh uh, narrated, uh, but it was uh, it was knowing that Watley was at Lot 141 in District 22 in Harris County, and 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 charting out all the neighbors, charting out uh, Jacob uh, Sistrunk Jr. That it became um, uh, pretty certain for us where Frances and her children. Uh, were enslaved. And this is that um, this is that map, again, courtesy of Georgia Archives. Um, and that's uh, actually uh, District 21, which was in fact called Dowdell's District. And that's those those blocks of lots that turned out to be uh, central as we mapped the lots out and then mapped out locations of, uh, of key persons. Uh, it turned out that uh, along this area, uh, a creek called Dowdell's Creek, and still call that today, uh, Dowdell's Creek was central and Dowdell's land was central uh, to the industry of that area. Dowdell owned a, uh, a grist mill and so much of uh, the life in this area, especially early when they first settled there in the 1820s, centered around um, this um, this area and uh, and the creek. Slave importation records led us to an 1831 deposition with James Dowdell declaring a number of enslaved people he was bringing into the state of Georgia. One, a young boy named Shadrick. Dowdell's will revealed that at the, that at the time of his death in 1852, he claimed two enslaved men named Shadrick. One likely, the, the now adult Shadrick, that he brought into the state in 1821, and the second, likely his uh, uh, his son uh, Shadrick, uh, uh, who uh, had been born uh, it, uh, after they moved into the Harris County and then later Lee County, Alabama areas. And this discovery. <laughs> actually came after the publication of the book. Uh, but again, it 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 um it, it it was made possible by all of that mapping work that we had done. And I I I've just been so fortunate to to have students working with me who are just extremely curious. So I had one student um 
just out on the wide, wide web, uh, Googling everything she could about Watley's. And she came across a YouTube site where uh, this, uh, this person was um, giving this account of his attempts at restoring uh, an old homestead in, uh, in Harris County. And it turned out that homestead is actually, uh, according to the, the lore in Harris County, is the oldest standing uh, homestead, European descent, uh, uh, of European, European descent in Harris County. It was one of the first homesteads. And it was, it, it, it is the original homestead of Seaborn, J. Watley. So we um, we were really excited that um, uh, the the um, the owner, the resident at that time, actually uh, welcomed us to come visit and gave us a tour of the house uh, and the property and the history of the Watleys there that he uh, and others uh, are aware of. And so these are just um, some pictures of uh, present day locations in Harris County that um, uh, that were owned by, again, these three key characters in the story. Uh, if you are fam familiar with uh, Pine Mountain, uh, the park area there, uh, uh, that property was uh, all owned by the Dowdells. Uh, James and Louis Dowdell were brothers. They were uh, among the first, you know, first um, uh, uh, settlers, white settlers in the area after uh, the lands were were uh, taken from the native people. Um, uh, Watley, in fact, was a surveyor. He surveyed much of that that land. And um, Dowdell uh, came in early at that time, too. So Lewis and James owned uh, property. If you stand at what's still today called Dowdell's Knob uh, at the top of Pine Mountain, if you go and stand there today uh, and you look down across that valley area, a good chunk of that land was Dowdell uh, and Watley land. Um, and then the Watley Cemetery uh, is also uh, uh, still in this location, just uh, a matter of uh, 100 yards or so uh, up the highway from the original homestead. I, I would argue that there is uh, great certainty that there are there are slave cemeteries uh, in in that area. Uh, in fact, there are there's one local uh, who does a lot of work in in Harris County, um, and I've I've been in contact with him over this last year or so, and and have a trip plan down there again in a couple of weeks. Uh, and um, he um, he's pretty certain. He's in fact, he's passionately certain uh, <laughs> and uh, wants to explore ways uh, to, uh, you know, to to locate not well, locate them in a sense officially because um, the locals are pretty certain about um, their existence. Uh, but then there's just a matter of getting a kind of formal acknowledgement of that. Yeah. So the culmination of these sources led to a significantly different genealogical sketch of Noah Sistrunk ancestry than I had imagined at the start with any Sistrunk's outline. And this just uh, kind of gives a sense of that. Um, so uh, again, where, um, where it ended with Shadrick um, and nothing on his five other siblings or Francis, um, by the time we finished combing 
uh, the archives and capturing these other stories and doing site visits. Uh, the and again DNA, uh, the the genealogy uh, shifted significantly. Um, <clears throat> Um, let me see. Let me see what my time is looking like. Yeah. OK, I'm going to just try to go to Mississippi really quickly then uh, to just give you a sense of how it unfolds and then open up for questions. Um, and I won't get to talk about it a lot, but um, uh, Jacob uh, Sistrunk moves his family to Mississippi sometime around the 1850s. Uh, and uh, they are there during the war and afterward. Uh, Jacob is, he's somebody ought to write much about him too in his, his time as a, as a soldier because he moves around the three county area there in Mississippi, uh, Noxubi, Winston, and Neshoba, uh, for the most part skirting his um, military duties. Uh, <laughs> But, but showing up at pay time. <laughs> so when when the war when the war is over, he he ends up uh, he has taken Frances and her children to Noxubi County, and this is where they are at the end of the war, and this is essentially where they stake their claim. Uh, and so by the 1880s, Shadrick and Hillman. Uh, have bought land uh, as as free men, and this is just one of the um, uh, tax rolls showing showing them on there. Um, and this is a map of Natsubi County, uh, and I'll, I'll flip real quickly to give a better view of where their land is. And and so um, Shadrick has 162 acres, Hillman 81. Uh, Hillman's Acreage is, is most notable, however, because uh, it turns out that he, on, on, on the land he owned, uh, was the site of the 1832 uh, Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. And that was a creek, I mean, that was a treaty, of course, which, um, you know, began the, the removal of Native people um, out of those territories. And uh, and that was um, that was um, Hillman's land. And this is um, a picture of the uh, church where uh, the Sistrunks and and I, I make that connection through Noah Sistrunk, who was a member of uh, of the church there. And you know, back to church records as well. Um, uh, I, I, I was put in contact with a, a secretary of the, the person who's the church, uh, who's, who's, a, who's the present secretary of the church, and she was really helpful in getting me things like the 1990 deed uh, for the church and the old picture. Um, um, Hillman, uh, yeah, it's a, a long story. Uh, but Hillman, the, the story ends with both Hillman and Shadrick losing their land, um, uh, Shadrick before he died. Uh, Hillman uh, didn't lose his land until after his death, but, but he, he died in the Mississippi Insane Asylum three months after being admitted. Um, this picture of the jail, uh, I didn't realize how significant it would be to the story until after uh, I made a site visit to the the archives, um, the county archives there, uh, and discovered uh, the story of uh, Hillman being committed and uh, eventually remanded to the insane asylum. And as it turns out, it was that jail where he would have been held in 1919. He was held over. Uh, until he was transported to Jackson. And just as an earlier story today, it's a jail that is now a library of all things. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> and that's the census record showing Hillman uh, in, the, in the asylum. And um, those are some early pictures uh, of the asylum 
uh, which was founded in 1856. Uh, I did. It's um, it's in the book. It's a long story, and it's it's a heartbreaking story. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a bit much. And today at uh, the asylum, in fact, is an archaeological site, uh, the University of Mississippi Medical Center, uh, which now, um, uh, uh, you know, inhabits this area that was once the asylum. And they were a few years ago about to do some construction. Uh, there was the discovery of bodies, and by the time it was over, there's the estimation that there are over 7,000 bodies there. Um, so um, this is, uh, they've just begun the excavations in fall of last year, uh, and the area, uh, in fact, where they're excavating right now is probably the area where Hillman was buried. Um, that's the estimate that I'm getting from the archaeologists. They they were, and this is, you know, of course, as heartbreaking as his story is, finding him there was so central to finding out so much else about this family, which is is really a, a paradox. Um, but he, um, you know, he, he, he's not a name that was ever discussed in my family. Um, actually, one person kind of mentioned him. Uh, and, uh, but finding him there uh, led to doing, you, you know, led, led to uh, us to a much deeper, you know, search for information. And in that, it's, you know, it really was the inspiration for filling out their story uh, in Knoxville County, you know, in, in, in wanting to find out what happened, um, because they um, their story is an amazing story of African Americans after the Civil War. Um, you know, nothing they had they they had nothing, uh, and they found ways to work together to own their own land. Uh, they were very successful, and 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 to see him in there. Uh, was 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 really, uh, you know, quite quite a moment, quite a discovery. But it also answered a lot of other questions uh, for me as well um, in terms of my my family, my grandfather, and that kind of thing. Were you here when Tamika did her presentation? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that was part of that emotional. Yeah. Part of the, yeah. Part of the story for you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'll end here. This is, um, uh, and again, for, uh, you know, for as 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 awful uh, as Hillman's End was, to go, though, today to, you know, to Knoxville and Winston, where they started off at the end of the war, uh, and to, and, and, you know, and to see names of streets, uh, in these communities where they were after the war, were named after, uh, you know, Sistrunk or Sistrunk descendants, uh, is really inspiring. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's this sense that, uh, you know, they were staking their claim. They have staked their claim, no matter what. And I think that's, I'm going to end there. That's the the, uh, the small sliver of road, uh, Kalsus Trunk Road in Natsubi County, um, which is near the church, uh, the Brush Fork Church. All right. And uh, I think I'm going to stop with that so that we will have time for questions. Yeah. Um. These are the um, these are the cistrunks who were the um, the first generation. At least on the very left is a picture of um, of who I grew up uh, as a small child. Um, I I knew her. She was my grandfather's. Um, great aunt, I think. She was, she was Shadrick's daughter. Um, and 
I knew her as a as a young kid before she died, and I knew her as Sophie. And it wasn't until I started doing the research that I realized that at some point she claimed the name Francis. And <laughs> yeah, about how they changed their names. Yeah, yeah. So at some point, but but it, you know, I, I understand the significance of it now too, because what I also learned was that she was the person who was central actually in maintaining and telling the story of mm -hmm. Francis. Uh, because as also was mentioned earlier today, no one ever told me about anybody named Francis Sistrunk in our in our lineage. And then after I found the um the found her in the census, I just started asking questions of older family members. And it was just like, you know, it, it uh, you know, their response was, oh yeah. Um, you know, as if, you know, I should have known this. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so finding the census record was the way in which the story opened up when the information was was there. Uh, yeah, and so Sophie on the end is uh, she was one of those uh, family members who was central in and uh, recording and retelling the story of uh, of Francis, and 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 again later in life actually took. Her grand that would have been her grandmother took her grandmother's name. And um, the center picture actually is my grandfather, Carl, as uh, a very young boy, I guess, and his cousin, uh, Will Grimmett. And back to these census records, because uh, for as long as I can remember as a child, my aunt had this picture and no one ever said uh, who Will Grimmett was. <laughs> And then I do the census records, and 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 uh, Will Will Grimmett was the son of of Shadrick's um, uh, sister, I think. Wait, wait a minute, I'm getting it cut. Carl and Will were cousins, uh, so uh, uh, no, so Noah's sister. So Will was yeah, Will was the son of Noah's sister. But I would have had no idea had I not, you know, found it in the census. And then once I found it, I started asking. And that's how I got the other photo, because then uh, one of the elders in my family said, oh, yeah, the Grimmets, they, they were cousins. And I've got this picture. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I'm really learning how important it is to just talk to people and sometimes, you know, even at the risk of annoying them because pe because people know they just don't always feel that it's important or it's worth talking about but it's amazing what 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 they do know oh yeah i was just going to say that's that's really important about interviewing people yeah uh, it's uh, one of the most underutilized forms of genealogy research yeah yeah so yeah i gave a workshop on that one time uh, that's a uh, that's a whole subject under itself. But yeah, I, but I, I just wanted to point out it. Like you said, it's important. It, it is, and uh, yeah, I learned it. Uh, you know, it took me a couple of years to figure it out, but but yeah, but, yes. Makes me think about in my parent, my husband's family. Did you go first? In my husband, can you hear? In my husband's family. Yeah. Anyway, so sorry. In my husband's family, um, on his grandmother's side, on his mother's and father's side, they all owned land. But over time, we were wondering what happened to all the land they owned. And we know that some timber, I guess the timber companies would Tim, yeah. encroach on their land. But my question is, did they just do the land grabs and and never register it, or did would they register it as if this this was their land, or they just stole the land and you know it? You know what I'm finding it was a mix of so many so many factors. Um, you know, for for instance, with with uh, Hillman and Shadrick, um, the way I, I I was able to piece their story together was in following the track of the yearly um, deeds, trustee deeds that they had to to no not 
do they call those things? Um, it's really it, it, essentially just borrowing money uh, uh, every year. Um, uh, I forget what they call these. Trustee deeds is. Commiss they call them trustee deeds, but there's another name for it too. But each year they borrowed in, in you know, in, in essentially mortgaging the land. And they did that to be able to make their crop. So if you have a bad year, your 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 land is at risk, and this is what happened to you know to so many of them. And so there was the loss that way, um, and then there was the loss uh, of Hillman. Hillman owned his land till he died, and it was really unfortunate the way he lost his land. It was a, his wife of his lifetime had died, and he remarried and. Um, mm -hmm. And the remarriage um, ended up in the sale of his land for a little of nothing. Yeah. I think we're about done, but maybe one more question at least. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 it's very deliberate. Frances uh, throughout her life maintained that spelling with an S. Um, her her descendants uh, Hillman Shadrick uh, and John John fluctuated, but but the story goes in my family, and it, and that's why it's so interesting to see how the records cor oftentimes corroborate the, the 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 oral lore. But the story in my family was that after the war, the white sistrunks would have the postmaster deliver the male of the the black cis trunks so that they could um, essentially um, preview their mail before being delivered. So um, they changed their spelling to C. And, and of course, there's all kind of like uh, humor behind that, right? C for colored. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, and see just to make a difference. But, you know, it was way, it, it was their way of claiming their independence from the former enslaver, uh, but also by, by using that C spelling, which one could easily, you know, associate with the racial connotation of colored, which no white man in, you know, post reconstruction South wanted to be associated with. Uh, so they just let the mail then go to, um, to, you know, to where it was it was being sent to the black cis trunks. And yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, that that story gets told every every family reunion. <laughs> uh, and 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 again, it's interesting to see how the records follow the story, though, because you see them early on still using that that S uh, for cis trunk. And by the time we get to the 1870s, when I see them on deed records and and tax records, uh, sometimes they spell it S C, and then finally it's just C. And and for the generations after, uh, it's cis trunk with a C. And um. I know we have a break now, so if anybody just wants to take a peek at the book, I, I brought a couple of copies uh, if you want to. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for uh, my computer. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.